What's up guys, it's Dalmatter here, and today we're going to be reacting to The Horus Heresy Explained in 20 Minutes. So this is from The Doomer Den, which is actually a relatively small channel, about 15k. Uh, but I had been reacting to the other Warhammer lore videos, and I was asking certain questions about The Horus Heresy, and somebody said that I should check out this video because it explains a decent amount of it. Um, and yeah, not much else to say other than that. Uh, so link to the original video down below, and let's jump into it and learn more about The Heresy. Science fiction is a great genre for exploring the nature of humanity. Whether it's optimistic and hopeful for the future like the galaxy of Star Trek, or dystopian and over-commercialized like the world of Blade Runner, there's a variety of different outlines. Honestly, my biggest problem with Star Trek is how optimistic it is about the future. I find it, like, delusionally optimistic. That's why I've never really been a big fan of Star Trek. My dad fucking loves Star Trek. Like, growing up, he would always have, like, he had all the movies on VHS. He would constantly watch through all the different series over and over again. And, like, I'd, I'd seen a lot of Star Trek, and I could just never get into it. I found it, like, way too optimistic and unrealistic. Maybe, you know, maybe I'd like it more now that I'm not a fucking edgy teenager, like, all doom and gloom. But, like, I, I don't know. I just, yeah. I found it, like, way too optimistic for the future. The realm of science fiction can take. It's something that could be seen as a sign of humanity's future, what could happen based on a chosen path that mankind decides to take. But one thing I feel is overlooked in many stories is the potential regression of mankind. Sure, you might get stories about how mankind is enslaved by high-tech AI, but that's not exactly what I mean. When the Roman Empire fell, some people chose to use the term the Dark Ages to refer to the feelings of humanity's regression, and while it may not be completely accurate a term used, some people still associated with the loss of advancements made during the time of Rome. But what if such an age were applied to the future instead? A dark future where the technology of our modern day far exceeds the capabilities of what's possible in their time, where something as trivial as a cell phone or a toy drone would be coveted as a holy relic of the past. That is the state of humanity in the world of Warhammer 40,000. Regression, fractured remains of an interstellar empire, now led by an imperium that considers the individual to be as insignificant as a rodent. In the past, humanity once pioneered innovation and progress. Now, they are a superstitious and barbaric bunch, praying to the divine god-emperor of mankind to give them the smallest form of protection in an uncaring galaxy of countless horrors. Because in the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war. So I, I see a lot of people saying the grim darkness, and obviously it's, you know, just a, you know, it's a, it, the, like they're common English words, right? Grim and darkness. But the way I, he, I see, I hear people constantly say it, I, I feel like that's like the, a motto of Warhammer. I'm going to Google this real quick. Because like people say that way too often for it to be not the, the grim darkness. Grim darkness of the far future. Yeah, it's literally, okay, so it is a Warhammer. Motto. Okay. Because I was gonna say, I've seen so many people say the grim darkness, the grim darkness, the grim darkness. It's like, I, that's either the most, like, it, it, it just had, like, there was no way that so many people were using this, this same exact verbiage for it without it being a motto. Let the seas boil. Let the stars fall. So it takes the last drop of my blood. I will see the galaxy. Oh, we watched this more. trailer. What trailer was this? This is the Horse Heresy trailer, wasn't it? And if I cannot save it from your failure, Father, then let the galaxy burn. Hello Doomers and Doomettes, I'm your host Didi, and to go alongside the brand new edition release of Games Workshop's The Horus Heresy, I wanted to take some time to do some introductory content around the lore of the grim dark future. Now I know there's already plenty of very high quality YouTubers who put out some great Warhammer 40k content, but I wanted to do some videos that condense some of the real important elements of the setting into a digestible format for newbies to get into it. Because let's be real here, if you already know about the lore of Warhammer 40,000, there's probably someone you really want them to get interested into it as well. And if you're that unfortunate soul embarking on this quest for knowledge, you might not be willing to take the deep dive into the various multi-hour long video essays on the fall of mankind. So, so yeah, I've, I've been doing that. I think so far the longest video I think I've reacted to was, I want to say 45 minutes to an hour, somewhere in there. But I have some that are on the, like the, my list that I have to go through for these reactions. And 
so I think the longest that I have left is like an hour and 45 or something. And I've seen ones that are like three hours long. And I imagine at some point or another, somebody's going to ask me to react to them. Um, like the one was the, like the entire, the, the history of the timeline or something I saw pop up on my uh, recommended feed. And it was like three and a half hours long. And I'm just, I haven't watched it yet because I'm almost certain eventually someone is going to ask me to react to it. So with that said, I'd like to discuss elements of Warhammer 40,000 lore with the goal of making it easy to present for newcomers. And as such, it may not be as detailed as other channels, at least not at first. But for those of you curious to see what all the fuss is about or just looking to refresh your interest, then this is the place for you. And there isn't a better place to begin discussion of the setting of Warhammer 40k than with the civil war known as the Horus Heresy. So before we begin, as always, if this is content you're interested in, I'd just like to humbly ask for you to consider liking the video or even subscribing to help support this channel. And if you're a returning subscriber, thanks for coming back. So with that said, rev up those chain swords and allow me to introduce you to the Horus Heresy. You did it. You defeated me, Horus Lupercal. You really are the Warhammer 40,000. <laughs> what is that from? <laughs> I didn't say that. Our tale begins roughly 20,000 years into humanity's future. The human race has reached far and wide across the galaxy, with colonies spread out on countless worlds. Like most settings in science fiction, humanity found a way to develop faster-than-light travel in the form of a warp drive. This technology allows a ship to briefly enter an alternate dimension known as the Immaterium, or the Warp, before re-emerging into real space, far closer to the intended destination. The Warp can be considered the underbelly of real space, as it is a dimension of pure psychic energy reflective of the emotions of intelligent species in real space. The Warp is a realm of chaos, as it is also home to entities referred to as demons, each stemming from one of the four gods of chaos which reside in the Warp. It makes traveling through the Warp incredibly dangerous, as one must survive its perils and deal with its chaotic nature, but this is the price for faster-than-light travel. Essentially, we'll say to travel through the warp is like needing to drive through Detroit. By the 25th <laughs> millennium, humanity's re- I thought he was going to go with like a river sticks analogy, like having to cross the river sticks or something, but no, it's like driving through Detroit. That's funny. Which began to crumble. This was due to a mix of factors too long to get into, such as a robot uprising, wars with other alien species, and most importantly, warp storms increased, making travel through the Immaterium far more difficult and dangerous, which led many worlds to isolation. Planets such as Earth, now known as the Planet of Terra, who had become dependent on the resources imported from other worlds, would soon find their supply chain completely cut off. This period would become known as the Age of Strife, and during this time, humanity's countless colony worlds became more and more fragmented, isolated from one another, as the technology of what was once a golden age of mankind became a distant relic. This brings us to the 29th millennium, where a being known only as the Emperor of Mankind rose to power on Terra. His true origins are unknown, with some believing him to be an immortal who finally emerged during this period to guide humanity back into the light, but what was known was that he was the most powerful psychic in all of humanity. Seeking to unify the human race once more, he began what became known as the Unification Wars on Terra to bring the planet back under his control. And to do so, he created an immensely powerful genetically modified army known as the Thunder Warriors. If there is one thing we know about the Emperor's past, though, is if he truly is an immortal who lived through all of humanity, then he most likely was a Reddit user on r slash atheism at one point. <laughs> Man, I like this guy's humor. That's fucking funny. Yeah, him spurging out about... I was going to say, I've, I've, I've mentioned this in the other videos. This is like the one thing where I thought, you know... The, the the god emperor is so smart he's so smart he's so smart he's like the smartest person ever and it's it's like literally you could tell it was written by like that warhammer was written by an atheist because in reality and i say this as an atheist myself the vast majority of people need religion right they they just fall into like decadence and um or and or nihilism without it right people it's it's almost like you have you know and ironically um, I can't remember who originally said this, but, you know, the, the saying is something like, I ironically, believing in evolution isn't an evolutionary advantage. Because if you look at, like, the, the birth rates of people who are religious versus those who aren't, the birth rates for irreligious people is, like, less than one per couple, right? So you don't even have a – you have less than a halving rate, right? You're going to have basically every 20 years, roughly, the population of atheists is, like, getting cut in half. Right? And obviously their they're atheists are growing in number because less people are becoming religious, but that's only going to be true for so long. Um, whereas religious people, depending on how religious they are, it's anywhere from like a birth rate of like three all the way up to like eight. 
So, yeah, there's definitely an evolutionary advantage to being a religious person. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of like this uh, fucking milady atheism is like my one criticism of the god emperor. Wars. The emperor pushed for what he called the imperial truth. The emperor believed that religion was a shackle upon humanity, denouncing the existence of any and all gods, and believed that superstitious belief is what was holding mankind back from achieving the glory it deserved across the stars. The man was such a fedora lord, he personally <laughs> visited the last church on Terra to basically tell the lone priest there that religion is pretty cringe as he burned the building to the ground. <laughs> okay, in all seriousness, this took place in a novella called The Last Church, and there's a fantastic fan animation of the exchange between the priest and the emperor. I'll link that here, so I highly recommend watching that. With Terra now under his complete control, the Emperor turned on his Thunder Warriors, quietly having them exterminated, believing them to be ravenous barbarians whose goal was to help him unify Terra, but nothing more. With Terra now forming the capital of the new Imperium of Man, the Emperor looked to the stars. To begin a galactic campaign to reunite all of mankind, the Emperor created the 20 Primarchs, genetically modified, immensely powerful demigods who would serve as genetic templates for his plan to create the Space Marines. Perfect soldiers for humanity, with each Primarch having a legion of hundreds of thousands under his command. Now, it's said that the reason the Emperor sought to abolish religion was that he was aware of the Chaos Gods of the Warp and believed that by preventing religious belief, he could starve them of their power and could potentially destroy them. The Chaos Gods now saw him as a grand foe, and in fear of the Emperor leading humanity to challenge them, they created a warp storm within his laboratory and scattered the 20 Primarchs across the galaxy, each infant Primarch landing on an isolated human colony. Now, in addition to needing to unify the human colonies on his own, the Emperor also needed to travel world to world in an attempt to find his lost sons. And so, at the start of the 30th millennium, the Emperor of Mankind led his forces to reconquer the galaxy and rediscover the lost Primarchs in what became known as the Great Crusade. It didn't take long for the Emperor to find his first lost son, Horus Lupercal, located on the mining world of Chthonia, which wasn't too far from Terra. Upon his discovery, Horus was placed in command of his own space marine legion, the Lunar Wolves. Being the first lost son rediscovered, it was a period of great rejoicing, and the Emperor grew extremely close with Horus. As the two fought together, side by side in the Great Crusade, conquering worlds, saving each other's lives, and rediscovering other lost brothers, the strength of their camaraderie only deepened. Unfortunately, the same can't quite exactly be said for the rest of Horus's brothers. Though the Emperor may have been the leader of mankind, he was still but a man and a heavily flawed one at that. And he certainly was the kind of dad who had his favorites and others who maybe weren't exactly high up the father <laughs> approval list. Eventually, the Emperor rediscovered all 20 of his lost sons and gave them command of each of their legions. However, for unknown reasons, two Primarchs and their legions were completely erased from Imperial records with no trace of them remaining. Now, with the 18 legions of Space Marines spreading throughout the galaxy, each one led by their own Primarchs... I, like, it, it's funny, I'm just getting into Warhammer and I still want to know so badly what happened to those two. Like, I feel like if you've been a Warhammer fan for, like, almost 40 years that this has been out that's probably something that just drives you crazy you're just waiting for them to drop something about that hi mark the emperor saw fit to return to terra and bestowed horus his most favorite son with the newly created rank of war master horus was to lead the great crusade in the emperor's absence and the word of horus was to be second only to the emperor himself as an additional reward horus was even permitted to rename his legion from the lunar wolves to the sons of horus however the Emperor's departure was not an event celebrated by his sons. In fact, many felt betrayed by it. No one had any idea why he was leaving back to Terra, and upon returning to the planet, the Emperor had created the Council of Terra, a body of government separate from the Space Marine Legions, and it caused many of the Primarchs to feel that they were being cast aside and abandoned by the Emperor. Some had even feared they would go the way of the Thunder Warriors, and the Emperor would discard them when they were no longer perceived to be useful. Even Horus himself couldn't help but feel slightly betrayed that the Emperor would not even disclose to him why he was leaving the Great Crusade. So why did he leave? Well, the Emperor decided that he needed to begin a secret project to sever humanity's dependence on the warp for faster than light travel. You see, the Eldari species, who we can essentially describe as space elves, use a network of passageways in the warp called the Webway, which bypasses the dangers of demonic warp entities and allows for far safer travel. The Chaos Gods would be unable to corrupt humanity this way and hopefully further weaken their grasp on the galaxy. In addition, the use of the Webway would allow humanity to reach a new stage of evolution and intergalactic connectedness to hopefully elevate the species to an unstoppable empire to last for the rest of time. The risk was enormous, and the Emperor feared that should the Eldari or any other alien species
Syracuse find out of what he was attempting, they would risk everything to destroy the project. And so, this project began with the utmost secrecy as the Emperor worked on what would be known as the Imperial Webway Project. Of course, the Chaos Gods then became even more fearful of the Emperor, and they hatched a plan to corrupt the Space Marines to bring ruin to this Webway project. Having already corrupted the Primarch Lorgar of the Word Bearers after he was humiliated by the Emperor for believing him to be a god, Lorgar began to view the Chaos Gods as being as a true divine worship that humanity needed to serve and sought to corrupt Horus to bring humanity to their faith. The plan was to wound Horus with a poison blade, and the word bearer called Erebus would heal him, and in doing so, he would gift Horus with visions of humanity's future. Manipulating Horus's emotions and preying on his feelings of abandonment by the Emperor, he saw a vision of humanity progressing even further. A timeline where the Imperium was a violent and judgmental theocracy, where every act was committed in the name of worshipping the Emperor of mankind and several Primarchs as gods among men. And the business. We call this foreshadowing. The dark <laughs> gods of chaos manipulate. Yeah, the irony being that he is going to be a major cause of this, right? Putting his, fa basically forcing his father into this chair to stop the chaos gate from getting through. Manipulated Horus into believing the emperor had abandoned his sons in the hopes of elevating himself to godhood. A fact which seemed believable when it was revealed that the Emperor stole power from the gods, gods he himself denied the existence of in the creation of the Primarchs themselves. When Horus awoke from his vision, healed from his wounds, he pledged allegiance to the ruinous powers. It was at this point the galaxy began to divide. Magnus the Red, Primarch of the Thousand Suns Legion and one of the most powerful psychic minds in the galaxy, he became aware of Horus's incoming betrayal and attempted to warn his father on Terra. However, rather than doing what most normal people would do, like sending an email or attempting to give his dad a phone call, Magnus decided that he would attempt to psychically warn the Emperor by manifesting his psychic essence into the Emperor's personal throne room. This was quite possibly the worst possible thing he could have chosen to do. Okay, so now maybe he'll get into this, but I, I th see he's a bad guy now, isn't he? So why was he trying to warn about the? Did he get all butt hurt because he got in shit? Because isn't he a, a chaos primarch now? Father, something terrible is going to. Unbeknownst to him, <laughs> as the Emperor was developing his secret Imperial Webway project, he created a psychic barrier to protect it from the perils of the warp, but Magnus, sending his psychic message, had torn a hole through it, allowing demons to penetrate and invade the closed-off Webway project, destroying it for good, and through the shattered barriers of it, swarmed the Emperor's throne room in an unholy horde. The Webway project was now lost, and the Emperor was forced to remain in his throne room, stuck on a device known as the Golden Throne in a never-ending psychic battle to stop the demons from trying to invade Terra itself. The Emperor was furious. Believing Magnus to be the traitor to the Imperium and humanity, the Emperor dispatched Primarch Lehman Russ of the Space Wolves Legion to bring him to Terra for questioning. However, as Russ was en route to Magnus's homeworld, he received a message from Horus, his war master. Horus had told Russ that the Emperor changed his mind and had new orders, kill Magnus and wipe out his Legion. Horus now knew that he had to begin his rebellion against the Emperor. Secretly having swayed other legions to his cause, Horus was presented with one more problem that prevented him from opening rebellion just yet. He needed a way to deal with the loyalists within his own legion and the loyalists within others. Taking advantage of the planet Istvan III attempting to secede from the Imperium, Horus took the World Eaters, Death Guard, and Emperor's Children, as well as his own Sons of Horus Legion, to pacify the rebellion. He deployed the suspected loyalists of the Legion onto the ground forces of the planet, and as they attempted to crush the rebellion, Horus openly declared his betrayal against the Imperium. With the suspected loyalists of the Legion still on the planet's surface, Horus had the planet mercilessly virus bombed from orbit, annihilating many of them, with the traitors of the Legions later making planetfall to wipe out any survivors. This became known as the Istvan III Atrocity, and marked the start of Galactic Civil War. The Horus Heresy had begun. However, a lone frigate was able to escape the atrocity and warn the Imperium of the War Master's betrayal. And so the Emperor had sent these seven closest Space Marine legions in the area to the planet of Istvan V to put an end to Horus's rebellion. Three legions, the Raven Guard, the Iron Hands, and the Salamanders, were deployed as the initial assault force, followed by a wave of reinforcements from the remaining four legions, the Alpha Legion, the Iron Warriors, the Night Lords, and 
the word bearers. The same word bearers that were humiliated by the Emperor, and the very same word bearers who corrupted Horus and his legion to chaos in the first place. And unbeknownst to the rest of the Imperium, the Alpha Legion, Iron Warriors, and Night Lords had already sworn fealty to the War Master as well. So, when the first assault wave attempted to fall back for supplies and reinforcements from their allies, they were instead met with bolter fire from their supposed brothers, trapped between eight traitor legions. The Loyalists stood no chance against this trap. And as a result, the Raven Guard, Iron Hands, and Salamanders suffered heavy casualties. At that point, they were forced to retreat from the Heresy, hardly even capable of being considered legions at that point. And the greatest tragedy was the first Primarch death of the Heresy, as Ferris Manus, Primarch of the Iron Hands, was decapitated by his brother, Fulgrim. This was known as the Dropsite Massacre of Istvan V. The okay, so, was he the first Primarch to ever die, other than maybe the two that went missing? I had, I had no idea that, like, I, I knew that there was one Primarch that, like, apparently his, they only found his arm or something, and now they, like, worship it. I'm not, I can't, somebody had mentioned it in the comments in one of the other videos. I can't remember exactly the details. I'd have to go back and look at the comment. Um, <clears throat> but there's a certain, so how many of the Primarchs are 100% alive, and how many of them are 100% dead? And then there's obviously the two that we don't know what happened to them. Civil War had now kicked off in full, with countless battles spread throughout the galaxy. As the traitors now pressured the Imperium, the Loyalists had no idea how to combat this threat. With nearly three legions almost lost and barely recovering, some were sent back to Terra in an attempt to fortify the planet, while other legions, believing the Imperium to already have been destroyed, attempting to reformat it on the other side of the galaxy. Approximately a decade of warfare continued as Horus made his way to Terra for the climactic battle against his father. First off, attempting to keep the Loyalists that are already away from Terra occupied, Horus had commanded some of the traitor legions to occupy the others away from the planet to prevent reinforcements from arriving while he prepared for planet fall on Terra. Six traitor Primarchs and their legions had prepared to invade against only three Loyalist Primarchs and their own legions. The Emperor, still forced to remain on the Golden Throne, was unable to participate in the battle, as if he stepped off the throne for a moment, Terra would face demonic invasion. The assault on the Imperial Palace had lasted for over 50 days, with both sides locked in combat, with the Imperium slowly cracking under the pressure from Horus. However, on the 55th day, Horus received terrible news. Full reinforcements were coming from the final three remaining Loyalist Legions, and they would arrive on Terra in mere hours. Faced with a difficult choice, the War Master took a gamble. He lowered the shields of his flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, in a direct challenge to the Emperor. This would allow the Emperor to teleport himself, along with two of his Loyalist sons, Rogel Dorn and Sanguinius, as well as several bodyguards and soldiers to the flagship. However, the Golden Throne still needed someone to defend it against demonic invasion, and the Emperor had placed his personal friend, Malkador the Sigilite, one of the most powerful psychic minds in the galaxy, on the throne in his place. Teleporting onto Horus's flagship was easier said than done, as Horus had used his own psychic powers to scatter them across the ship, each forced to battle demonic forces as they made their way to the bridge. The first to reach the bridge was the Primarch Sanguinius, who had once in a prior life been one of Horus's closest brothers. Now they were enemies, as Horus attempted to sway Sanguinius to his side, but he- So, uh in a prior, like, does he mean, like, in a prior life as in, like, just earlier before Horus betrayed them, or, like, in a prior life as in they literally have reincarnation? He would have no part of it. And so, in a terrible battle of brother versus brother, Horus had slain Sanguinius by strangling him. As his lifeless body fell to the ground, it was at that moment that the Emperor stepped onto the bridge and locked eyes with his once most favored son. Horus attempted to convince his father of what he was doing, but the Emperor could see that his son was lost and was forced to engage him in combat. However, the Emperor was not capable of killing Horus, not because Horus was far more powerful, but because the Emperor still felt compassion towards him and could not bring himself to kill his most beloved son. Because of this, Horus was able to inflict devastating wounds on the Emperor, severing the tendons in his arms and gouging his eye. But as legend would have it, that as Horus prepared to kill his father, a lone Imperial soldier, a mere human with a gun, had made it to the bridge to see the devastating battle between demigods, and despite standing no chance against the War Master, this lone soldier stood his ground and defied Horus, and with a quick glare, Horus had obliterated the soldier from existence. However, it was at this moment that the Emperor knew the son he cherished was no more. Mustering the final bouts of his strength, the Emperor channeled everything into a final psychic blast that annihilated Horus. It is said that in his final moments of life, the Chaos Gods released their grip of corruption on Horus, shedding a single tear 
Horus begged his father for forgiveness, and the Emperor saw deep regret and sorrow in his eyes. However, he knew that this loosened grip on his son was temporary, and as a final act of mercy, the Emperor abolished Horus's soul from existence, so that even in death, the Chaos Gods would have no claim on his spirit, and could never be brought back again as their pawn. The psychic might of this attack had sent shockwaves throughout the warp, as the demons realized their pawn in the mortal realm was no more, and the traitorous forces began to flee Terra. Rogel Dorn had finally made- Wait, so Horus is dead too? Man, this entire time I thought these Primarchs were still running their... Uh, their legions. I, I thought the entire time that they were all still alive, and now I find out at least three of them are dead made it to the bridge of the vengeful spirit only to find the broken dying body of his father along with the corpses of two of his brothers. Dorn took his father and returned to the throne room where Malkador the Sigilite's body had been crumbling to dust as it struggled to hold back the demonic horde. In his final act, Malkador mustered what little psychic energy he could to bring life into the Emperor to allow him to be placed on the Golden Throne. The Golden Throne had now become a life support machine for the Emperor, keeping his dying spirit alive as he focused all his might on psychically defending Terra from the warp. The Horus Heresy had ended, and the casualties on both sides were without number. And that sets the stage for Warhammer 40,000. The Emperor, entombed on the Golden Throne, becomes seen as a divine being for his sacrifice, and the Imperium begins to worship him as the God Emperor of mankind, an ironic fate for one who tried to steer humanity away from religious values. After this point, the remaining Loyalist sons begin to disappear one way or another as they chased into the warp in an attempt to seek revenge on their traitorous brethren, or fell in combat. The remaining Trider Primarchs that weren't killed were gifted by the Chaos Gods and turned into demons themselves. However, in the 42nd millennium, a Loyalist Primarch finally has re-emerged. Robute Gilliman, Primarch of the Ultramarines, was resurrected to see what had befell the Imperium during his 10,000 years of slumber. Horrified at the regression of mankind, Gilliman now leads the Imperium against the forces of Chaos and various other threats against the galaxy. Hopefully that serves as your intro- Wait, so we're up to 42k at this point? Holy shit. Because I always see jokes about, uh, you know, we need to start Warhammer 41k, but apparently they're already at 42k. Production into the grim darkness of the far future. If any of this has caught your interest, the Horse Heresy just launched its new edition of the tabletop game, where you can paint miniatures or recreate the various historical events of the Heresy, or even create some new ones. I know I'm painting mine up like the Emperor's Children, and I'm going to be working on painting a Fulgrim model, who, I'll be honest, is kind of just Griffith in space, but I still love him. Up next we got... Griffith! <laughs> See it purple! Yeah! <laughs> but even if you're not sure if you want to get into the tabletop game, there's still a ton of books and content you could Jesus. pick up that I'm sure will be very much worth your time. What are your thoughts on the Horus Heresy? Would you side with the War Master or the Emperor? Couldn't Magnus have just sent an email to his dad instead of psychically ruining the entire Webway project? Should he be the topic of a Did Nothing Wrong video? Let me know in the comments below. As always- I mean, I- uh, so- I don't think he, he, well, he obviously did something wrong, but I don't think it was obviously not intentional. He didn't know any better, right? And that's the thing. Um, you know, should he have done it another way? Obviously, in retrospect, but the thing is, he didn't know because his father kept it a secret from all of them. Um, but isn't he a bad guy now, too? Which, like, how did he end up getting converted? What happened to him? Because I'm pretty sure he's the one with, like, the horns and shit now. Uh,. And how, how, so how many Primarchs are fucking dead now? This is this honestly, like, this is, like, one of the best explanations I've seen. Because, like, a lot of the videos I've seen from different people, they're, they're very, like, long. But a lot of the time, they're not as succinct. Do you know what I mean? And they're very good, too, but, like, in a different way. Like, this is very, here's what happened, here's what happened, here's what happened, here's what happened, here's what happened. And then there's, like, jokes everywhere. Um... But then, like, a lot of the other videos that I've watched, like, they're they're more narrated, and it'll be, like, a, a sample story, and then they'll be like, oh, so this, this, this. And that's it. And so, I actually, I, I like the way this guy does his videos, and uh, he's only got 15k subs. Yeah, 15k subs. So, only about five times what I have, which is, I guess, four times what I have. Um, so, yeah, definitely go check him out if you haven't already, because, you know, maybe actually some of you haven't. Um... Great stuff. So yeah, again, this is the horse heresy explained in twenty minutes uh, from the Doomer Den, um, and yeah, from a newbie perspective in the Warhammer world, I, I quite enjoyed his stuff. So maybe you will as well. And uh, link is down below. Let me know what you think. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.